ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the forum on May 23rd. We have a real interesting program today. We call this Relief from Politics. No, I'm just kidding. It's an interesting program in and of itself. We have Scott Beckstead here to talk to us about endangered species in Oregon. I did say last week that we weren't talking about Republicans or any other politicians at any strike. We were talking in terms of actual honest to goodness animals, and we're going to learn more about that today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Scott Beckstead. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I always start by sort of telling you a little bit about who I am and uh, where I come from. Uh, my name is Scott Beckstead. I am the Senior Oregon Director for the Humane Society of the United States, and I've also been the Campaign Director for Save Endangered Animals Oregon. Um, a little bit uh, about my, my personal history. I uh, born and raised on a small farm in southern Idaho, went to college and law school in Utah, and immediately moved to Oregon right out of Utah, where I practiced law over in Walport. Who's been to Walport? Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I practiced law in Waldport for 17 years. I uh, also served a stint as the mayor of, of Waldport for a few years. Sorry, I know you didn't want politicians, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I came to work for the uh, Humane Society of the United States, or as we call it lovingly, HSUS, uh, in 2008, and I was originally hired to set up a horse sanctuary on an 1,120-acre piece of property down in Douglas County uh, because I, I grew up with horses and working uh, on a ranch, and, and so um, that was my first gig, uh, but uh, once we found a full-time caretaker for, for the, the horse sanctuary, they moved me over into this role as uh, state director, and my job has been uh, working on all animal welfare issues here in Oregon, but especially when the legislature is in session, uh, I'm in the legislature uh, working to pass uh, legislation to protect animals and defeat uh, legislation that is harmful to animals. And it's a, a role that has been very, very rewarding, very challenging, and something that I've, I've very much enjoyed. Um, and uh, so, so, uh, in the 2015 legislative session, sort of how did we get here to talk about endangered species? Uh, in the 2015 legislative session, we uh, brought forth a bill that would have banned the sale of elephant ivory and rhino horn here in Oregon in recognition of the fact that these are two species that are on a collision course with extinction if we don't do something to, to save them. Um, you know, we, we, we pulled the issue internally. What we found was that we found that uh, across all the major demographics in Oregon, men, women, Democrats, Republicans, hunters, non-hunters, gun owners, non-gun owners, across all those different groups, uh, this measure was strongly supported by 75% or more of the people that we polled. So we knew that it was a very popular measure, and we, we, you know, we, we know that Oregon has a very strong and very proud tradition of passing laws to protect animals. And you know, when I talk to Oregonians in the course of my work, I, I, I ask them, you know, what are your top concerns when it comes to animal welfare? And the poaching crisis, the extinction crisis, is at or near the top of everyone's list. And yet, it's the one issue that so many people feel like they can't do anything about it. Because you know, what can we do here in Oregon to stop the slaughter of 96, or 96 elephants a day in Africa, or you know, the, 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 the 33,000 African elephants a year that are being slaughtered for, for their ivory? So, uh, so we brought this bill in 2015, and uh, the bill made it through the Senate uh, on a bipartisan vote. But once it got to the House, uh, it was killed by the House leadership uh, before it could get a hearing uh, in, in its committee. Um, and a big part of that reason was that the NRA opposed the bill because the NRA believes that uh, trophy hunters, wealthy trophy hunters who go to Africa to pay to kill these elephants should be able to bring their tusks back here to the United States and sell them. And uh, we know that that's a position that's at odds with the values of most Oregonians. So when the bill died, we kind of 
took a step back and said, you know what, what should we do here? Should we try another another bill in the next session, you know, or, or what? And what we decided ultimately was that we would actually give this give this decision to the voters of Oregon. And, um, and so we have composed a measure that is actually much stronger than the bill that we tried getting passed in 2015. Uh, it, it encompasses not just elephants and rhinos, but a total of 12 different kinds of animals that are, that are the most critically endangered. And they include elephants and rhinos, but they also include uh, big cats, like lions and tigers and leopards and jaguars and, and cheetahs. Uh, it also includes marine species, including sharks, rays, whales, and sea turtles. Uh, and then it also includes um, a very curious and very lovable little creature called the pangolin, uh, also known as the scaly anteater. The pangolin is the most heavily trafficked mammal species in the world. And many of us here in Oregon have never even heard of it, but it is a, uh, a creature that is covered with uh, thick scales. And those scales provide armor, so when it's threatened, it rolls up into a ball. Uh, which is a great defense against lions or hyenas, but against uh, high-powered rifles and snares and traps, uh, this animal is pretty much helpless and defenseless. And so it's a, it's a creature that is heavily trafficked. Its scales are actually ground, ground up and sold as a traditional folk remedy in Asian countries. It's also poached for its meat. And, uh, and it is, you know, the pangolin is going to go extinct in our lifetime if we don't do something to save it. And so we, 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 we composed this list of 12 different types of animals and we identified them as the types of animals that are the most endangered by the, the poaching crisis. And what this measure does is it imposes felony level civil fines that can be leveled by or brought by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife against anyone who is caught trying to sell the parts and products of these 12 types of animals here in Oregon. Um, so uh, it, it, um, it does not ban the possession of these items. It does not ban gifting these items. It does not ban handing these things down through your will or your trust. So for example, um, uh, if if you have a bona fide antique with 200 milligrams or less, 200 grams or less of, of ivory, let's say, that would be something that is not exempt or that is is not covered by this measure. Think, for example, of you know granddad's ivory handled revolver. If that's a bona fide antique over 100 years old, uh, that would not be covered by this this measure. Likewise, musical instruments like pianos that contain a, a de minimis amount of ivory would also be exempt. So what we're really doing here is we are looking at creating meaningful penalties for people that are po that are that are caught trying to traffic in the parts and products from these from these animals, with some common sense exemptions. So, um, so that's really what, what the measure does. And, and we've also exempted, for example, uh, native tribes. Uh, some native tribes uh, here in Oregon may, uh, for example, have whale bone uh, as part of their rituals and customs, and we've exempted those. But again, the focus here is really to tackle the commercial market in endangered animal parts and products. Um, Washington had a very similar measure uh, that was passed last year in 2015 by the voters of Washington by a 70 to 30 margin. It passed in all 39 counties in Washington, including uh, Eastern Washington, which demographically and politically is very similar to our Eastern Oregon. Uh, it passed by a huge, a huge majority. Uh, and in California, California has just passed a law that basically completely shut down the ivory trade in, in California. So uh, if we can get this done in Oregon, then what it means is that the west coast of the United States is suddenly an extremely hostile place for the smugglers that are trying to bring these products into our state. And uh, another newsworthy development, just in the past couple of weeks, the legislature of Hawaii has basically shut down the ivory market there. Uh, but, but uh, you know, 
Thank the you. first question that some people ask me when I when I uh, talk about this measure is, isn't this already illegal? Aren't there already laws to cover you know the trafficking in endangered species parts? And the answer is is yes. There are federal regulations that say that you cannot bring these products into the United States. But the problem is the smugglers are still bringing it in. And there's a very limited number of customs agents that are uh, trained and that uh, are deployed to look for uh, wildlife trafficking. And so uh, what we've done is we've created an additional le level of state enforcement so that um, if, if someone is caught selling these items, in addition to whatever federal penalties they may face, they are also going to face a very stiff uh, fine from the state of Oregon. So again, what we're trying to do is shut down the market and send a message to the poachers and to the smugglers that they will find no safe haven for their products here in Oregon. So uh, that's kind of a, a bit of a lead in. I do have a, a brief video that kind of explains uh, the, the issue a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more artfully than I can, and then uh, we can keep talking after. We have a chance to take the moral high road and to set an example to the rest of the world. This measure is an opportunity for Oregonians to pass a law to ban the trafficking in the parts of the world's most critically endangered species. Last year, over 70% of Washington voters passed this long overdue measure, and now it's our turn. If Oregon passes this measure and joins with California and Washington, we have the opportunity to shut down wildlife trafficking on the entire West Coast. This measure says to the poachers and the smugglers that they will find no safe haven for their products in our state. We really need to have all 50 states and the federal government do what they can within their own existing realm of authority to crack down on the trade in wildlife parts and to really strangle the market that exists for the poachers who are slaughtering wild animals in enormous numbers by the most inhumane methods. We're the stewards of the animals on this earth and we need to be able to speak up and, and take action on their behalf. The world's most iconic wildlife is under the threat of extinction. It's really beyond the pale of, of civilized behavior. Me coming from Africa, I've seen the worst and egregious forms of poaching incidences, I think, in the world right now. I support this measure because I have two little girls and I want them to live in a world with wild elephants and, and other endangered animals that uh, really are under threat right now. If we can't take care of our, our environment and our animals and the, the creatures we share this world with, then I don't see much of a future at all for our kids. The thugs that are involved in the trade of endangered species are some of the most reprehensible on the face of the planet. Who are these people who poach and kill for money? Some are malicious terrorist organizations, such as Joseph Kony and his Lord's Resistance Army. They're slaughtering animals, including over 30,000 elephants a year, and driving them to the precipice of extinction. We know, for example, that they have poisoned entire families of African elephants by putting cyanide in the watering holes, causing the entire group of elephants to suffer terribly before they're killed and their tusks taken from their bodies. We have seen incidences where um, elephants are shot from helicopters using high powered caliber rifles. It is barbaric, and there's no other way to describe it. If we're not careful, they will result in the eradication of species like the elephant within our lifetime. Poaching is one of the largest ways that they raise money to support their terrorist activities. Oregon has a port, and there are illegal wildlife products here, and they are bought and sold every day. Ultimately, we need to eliminate the demand for the sale of these endangered species parts, because when the buying stops, the killing can too. And we've got a role in the United States and other industrialized nations because we're buying these parts in the marketplace. We've got to stop buying these parts, and we also have to have laws that forbid their sale. The minute you stop the sale, the demand stops too. This is why this measure is important. There's no question that we have an opportunity here in Oregon and Oregonians will send a message to the nation and the world. This measure should be an issue on which every thinking, caring American and citizen of the world should agree on. If we don't stop it, many of these species can be gone in our lifetimes. Working together, 
we can save them from extinction. People are aware now and they care and they, they want to do something. Oregon has a long and proud tradition of passing laws to protect animals. And in November, we have the opportunity to continue that tradition by passing this measure to protect the world's endangered wildlife. For more information, visit SaveAnimalsOregon.com. So you saw, uh, you saw in that in that uh, that video, uh, our three chief petitioners, um, Bruce Starr, Earl Blumenauer, and Tom Hughes. Uh, they are the three individuals who basically signed their name on the dotted line with the petition to the Secretary of State, saying that that, that we wanted to proceed with the petition. And to me, the the uh, that. Three-person panel of chief petitioners really speaks to the, the diversity of support that we have for this measure. Uh, Earl Blumenauer, of course, is a Democratic congressman from Portland. Bruce Starr is uh, a very proud conservative Republican from actually from this part of the, of, of the state who served in the uh, Oregon State Senate for many years. And then Tom Hughes is the president of Metro Council, which owns and operates the Oregon Zoo and has a very strong uh, conservation mission with respect to uh, endangered species. So um, we've got these three very strong leaders uh, from around the state uh, working to lead the, the campaign. Uh, and the measure is supported by a broad and diverse coalition of organizations uh, like the Oregon Zoo Foundation, the Oregon Coast Aquarium, the Oregon Humane Society, but also international, like the International Fund for Animal Welfare, uh, Wild Aid, the Kenyan Legal Project. Uh, you saw Jim Karani, the African lawyer, who, who spoke about his experience in his native land fighting to protect uh, African wildlife. Uh, so we've got a very diverse uh, group of, of organizations that support the measure. We've got strong leaders. Um, and right now, in terms of where we are with the campaign, we are in the signature gathering uh, portion of the campaign. We have to turn in over 88,000 signatures in order to get this measure on the ballot. And we have to do that. We've set uh, a June 27th deadline for ourselves. But we've actually... 88,000 is what the Secretary of State's number is, but you have to have a cushion because a certain percentage of your signatures are going to be invalidated, right? So we've actually set a goal of 126,000 signatures uh, to be gathered. And we, uh, we have great volunteers out there, but if I had to, to put one sort of ask out there for all of you, if you're interested in helping with the campaign, is... Um, uh, go to the website www.saveanimalsoregon.com and find out how you can help. Sign up to be a volunteer, get a packet, circulate it, even if you circulate it among your, your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and your co-workers, it's all going to add up and it's all going to help. So uh, it's, it's an issue that, that really defies uh, political ideology or political uh, distinction. As you saw, we've got you know, uh, proud conservative Republicans on board. Um, you know, it, w one of the things that I think appeals to, to conservative is the, the link to terrorism. Uh, because uh, Republicans are very strong on national security issues, and this is an issue that is absolutely one of vital national security, because the poachers are getting their weapons and their supplies from terrorist organizations like Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, the Lord's Resistance Army. These are vicious criminal organizations that are bent on destabilizing vulnerable African governments and, and, and endangering entire populations of, of people within, within uh, Africa. And they provide uh, things like helicopters, machine guns, and other weapons to these poachers, and then the poachers turn around and give a portion of their proceeds back to the terrorists, and that's how that works. So if, you're, if, if, if someone is buying yeah, that's so illegal ivory, uh, their, their money is going to support some of the, some of the worst terrorist organizations uh, at work in the world right now. So it's, it's not just an issue of, of protecting animals. It's also, it's, it's much bigger than that. And, and of course, you know, like Jim Karani, the African lawyer that you saw, uh, he talks about the fact that 
a poacher will get about $12,500 on average from a big set of tusks from an African elephant. $12,500. But that elephant, over the course of its 70 plus year lifespan, brings in an average of $1.6 million in tourist revenues. So part of this effort, in addition to shutting down the commercial market, which is what we're trying to do with this ballot measure, we are also trying to support efforts to encourage African countries to see the economic value of protecting these animals and instead of going for the short-term gain uh, of, of, of the poaching brings, instead to see the long-term investment of offering these wild creatures up to the entire world to, to enjoy uh, either as tourists or, or even just you know, what you see on TV or on National Geographic or whatever. It would be, of course, a tragedy to lose these animals uh, so that they can be enjoyed by future generations. So that's a little bit about the, the issue and about the campaign, and um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Let's we'll line up for questions. Um, Let's see, I think we've got Bill coming right in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Scott, go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to ask you to ask a question. My name is uh, Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. Thanks for coming in. You bet. I, I applaud you and your group and what you're doing. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I, I think one of the worst things against animals today is climate change. Right. And, uh, you know, it's going to affect not just endangered animals, but all of us at some point. Uh, and, and I get concerned a lot of times that not a lot of stuff is being done about, about maybe trying to do something to mitigate it to some degree. I'm just curious if your group even talked about this and, and uh, maybe why, maybe some lawsuits against like the Koch brothers and some other outfits that are, you know, polluting the, the atmosphere might be in order. Well, I appreciate the question, uh, and although climate change isn't directly uh, addressed by this measure, it certainly is uh, an issue that is fundamental to the well-being not only of every living non-human creature on the earth, but also to all of us, because it's going to affect uh, our food supply, it's going to affect the water supply, it's going to affect uh, international uh, stability, um, and, and absolutely, I mean, I, I, I uh, uh, I think that we need to incorporate the global climate change issue more into wildlife conservation because there is no doubt, uh, you know, even when you talk to our local ODFW officials here in, in Oregon about, you know, the effect that changing climate has on our own indigenous species, the, the mule deer, for example, you know, there's just not enough forage uh, for species like that, and a lot of that has to do with drought and climate change and um, you know it, it causes populations of animals to have to rapidly adjust their migration patterns it, it affects everything from mule deer to black bear to salmon to trout and there's no doubt it, it's it's absolutely an issue so i appreciate the question hello i'm elizabeth burris hello elizabeth hello uh, i really congratulate you on this program uh, I was a chief petitioner twice for a ballot measure in Oregon to ban leg hole traps. Yes, and I Wayne Pacelli was very, very important. Is there any hope that your organization, as a humane society, might take that up again? Uh, because we failed twice. The NRA poured a great deal of money into that, opposition to that. But ballot, uh, leg hole trapping is going on. Trappers come yes. on my land and, and try yes. and take up animals. Yes. Yes, thank you for the questions. The, the question involves uh, the use of, of steel jawed leg hold traps and other body gripping traps like neck snares. Uh, we tried unsuccessfully in 2000 to pass uh, a measure that would have restricted the use of those items. Um, I will tell you this, Elizabeth, as long as I draw breath, I will never stop fighting to get rid of traps and snares. They are cruel. They are indiscriminate, and Oregon has some of the worst, most lax tra trapping regulations in the western United States. If you set a, a trap for a coyote, you don't have to check that trap for 30 days. And if that means that you happen to catch a fawn or an endangered bald eagle or some other animal, 30 days. 
for an animal, and 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 it's 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 outrageous, and and it's also outrageous that our tax dollars are funding a lot of it because a lot of this trapping is being done by uh, a federal agency called Wildlife Services that slaughters, you know, 2.7 million animals across this country every year, um, largely at the behest of private. You know, interests like uh, livestock producers and and uh, and uh, you know the, the logging industry and so forth. So, uh, we believe that there are better, much more humane ways of dealing with problem animals. Um, and you know, the thing about leg hold traps is they are completely indiscriminate. You can set it for one animal and end up catching someone's dog. Um, you know, back in 2012, we had a horrible, horrible summer where. Uh, somewhere upwards of a, a dozen family pets were caught in steel jawed leg hold traps, um, you know, including a, um, a dog that was that was caught uh, in Gresham. Uh, Wildlife Services had placed a bunch of uh, conibear traps, which actually snapped down over an animal's rib cage and folded underwater. And this was this was this was uh, just behind these people's backyard, and the traps were set by Wildlife Services to catch nutria. No one in the neighborhood had even seen a new tree, but there were these traps running all up and down the creek that ran behind their homes, and it caught these people's uh, Springer Spaniel, a sweet family pet, killed her, uh, and these traps were also, uh, you know, not too far from where the kids uh, caught the school bus, and, and um, as I said, as long as I draw breath, I will forever try and get rid of traps and snares from Oregon. Well, it's, I'll join you. And it is on. inexcusable that, that we still use them, and it's inexcusable that our state and federal wildlife managers continue to champion them like they're the best thing since cancer. Could I ask you another question? Yeah. Has Earl Bloom and I introduced legislation in the Congress uh, to mirror this uh, Oregon um, measure? Uh, he has not, although uh, Congressman Peter DeFazio has introduced what is called the Tusker Act, which uh, would require the United States to impose trade sanctions on any group or any nation that has a severe elephant poaching crisis and doesn't take steps to, to try and solve it. Uh, uh, Congressman Blumenauer is uh, the head of the National Animal Protection Caucus, which is a group of a bipartisan group of uh, people in the United States Congress that uh, feel strongly about animal protection. Maybe we're... we should ask him to introduce such a bill. As a former Kenyan, I, I really this is so important. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Phil Nelson, former member. I have a kind of a personal question. Sure. I, I really support your measure. I want to get one of those kits for getting some signatures. <laughs> okay. But uh, I'm one of the uh, people who's inherited a couple pieces of ivory. Right. And uh, I found it pretty basically impossible to sell this stuff. And I'm wondering, does your law allow, you did mention that uh, there can be some limited trade in antiques, uh, which is what I've got. Uh, yes. I was kind of curious about that. Uh, uh, so a bona fide antique that's 100 years old or older would be exempt um, if it is an item that contains 200 grams or less of, of the prohibited uh, item. So again, you know, the most common uh, example that I think of is like, you know, uh, maybe uh, grandma's uh, brooch that has a piece of ivory in it or, or granddad's ivory handled revolver. If those are bona fide antiques, they would be exempt from the measure. And you would, of course, still be able to pass those items down to your heirs or your beneficiaries through your will or your living trust. So there are exemptions for things like that. Again, what we're trying to do, they're trying to stop the market and the stuff that's being freshly poached and, and the stuff that's being brought in. And you know, one of the questions that I get, get asked is, is this, is this a problem here in Oregon? Um, and just anecdotally, I can tell you that last summer, uh, we learned about a small antique show, sort of a traveling antique show that was going to be setting up uh, in the Portland area. And so we had a couple of people just go and see if they could see any of these, uh, these uh, items there. And uh, sure enough, there's a man and he's got a table and there's a bunch of carved ivory on his table. And they asked him, is this, is this all legal? Is all the your ivory here legal? And he said, that what you see here is legal, but if you want to see my illegal stuff, it's right back here. And sure enough, he had a whole bunch of, of, um, 
of ivory that was illegal and and when when asked is is there a demand for this here in Oregon he said oh absolutely there's a big demand and it's a constant demand so uh, a lot of these things are being bought and sold on the internet uh, a lot of being you know a lot of being bought and sold at these sort of you know these kind of uh, antique sales and things like that uh, so yeah it's it's a problem in Oregon I'm Maureen Hong and I'm a member of the forum you mentioned that fines would be given, but what kind of fines? How much are those fines? Are they fines that would really be important? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So basically, uh, uh, the, the fine is a felony level fine, which is $6,250, or double the value of the item, whichever is more. So, I have another question. Do sure. you have any of the petitions with you today that we can sign? Out in my car, I do. Bring them in. I, I will. I'll believe yes, you. I don't want anyone out of this room. Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Uh, my apologies. I was today. I do meals on wheels, so I got here as fast as I can, but a little bit late. So if this is a repetitive question, my apologies. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, the mechanics. Does this is this just based on what people say they're bringing in? Is there anything that deals with smuggling? Is there any way to stop it from going below eye level? The way the way it works now is most of the uh, illegal items that are brought in. Uh, are discovered by customs officials, which of course U.S. Customs, these are federal federal agents. Uh, so those federal agents, if they catch the items that are coming in, in addition to the, the federal penalties, they could also be referred over to the state for the felony level fines. Um, but it will also be complaint driven. So for example, uh, if this same antique show comes back to Oregon and someone goes and sees uh, you know, illegal ivory, uh, they can notify ODFW that can then take uh, the appropriate enforcement action in addition to turning them over to the feds. So. Chris Leslie, foreign member. Uh, I looked up the Oregon endangered species, there's 11 in Oregon, and four were plants. I was hoping you'd have an example of the plants so we could get to know them. Do you have any background in the plant endangered species? Uh, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm a, an animal guy, not a plant guy, but I can tell you this. Um, Oregon's wildlife uh, is, is protected by an Endangered Species Act, and you, you might recall there was some controversy in the past year or two over wolves, over where the wolves should be taken off the state endangered species list, okay? Um, so we have an Oregon Endangered Species Act, uh, and, and uh, we know that uh, there are um, ongoing efforts by our state uh, wildlife officials to protect those endangered species. But I will say that, uh, this measure actually is in lockstep with a bill that was passed here in Oregon in, the, in this past uh, 2016 session to substantially upgrade penalties for poaching of uh, animals here in Oregon. Uh, so for example, it used to be, you know, a fine that was nothing more than a slap on a wrist to, to poach an animal like a cougar or a black bear, for example. And now with this new bill, uh, it substantially increases the, the fines and creates, I think, a much more effective deterrent to, to poachers. The Humane Society of the United States, uh, we estimate that at least as many animals are illegally poached as are legally taken by licensed hunters. So we know that poaching is, is a serious problem here in Oregon as well. So on that website, they said the bald eagle was not uh, endangered now. I think it's been taken off the endangered species list. It may, I don't know if it's still listed as vulnerable or, lot, or not, but the, the bald eagle is a real success story and shows the Endangered Species Act working as it was assembled. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Scott. I'm Rob Solomon, a forum member, and thank you for being here. Uh, I really appreciate the measure, and I think there's an awful lot of support in this room for it. You'll see it when you pull the stuff in from your car. On a slightly different tack, I'm just wondering if you have an opinion on animals in zoos. I'm sure you're well aware that many zoos have shut down throughout North America, etc. And I think there's 
interesting arguments on both sides. I was just wondering what your take was on animals and zoos. My position is nuanced. <laughs> How's that? Good start. Uh, I think some zoos do a much better job than others. And I think there are some animals that do far better in captivity than others. I think that zoos were once kind of uh, a source of amusement where you took your kids and you watched the lion, you know, pacing back and forth in its, you know, in its tiny little cell with, with the iron bars and the concrete floor. And I think those days are, are past. I think that zoos have embraced a conservation mission. I think that uh, just speaking about the Oregon Zoo, I believe that they take their mission to educate and inform and raise awareness to be at least as important as their job in taking care of the animals that live there at the zoo. So, um, so you know, I, I would say, you know, I, I know uh, there are zoos that, that uh, are substandard. Uh, there are some zoos that do a really fantastic job. You know, that's why we have the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, because they actually inspect and accredit zoos and aquariums across the country and they set a, a standard and you have to reach that standard if you're going to be uh, if you're going to be uh, accredited i will also say this though that i think that with the retirement of the ringling brothers elephants from the circuses yeah and with the announcement by SeaWorld that they are ending their captive breeding program and no longer featuring uh, performing orcas, I, I think that these are two watershed moments between Ringling Brothers and SeaWorld, two really significant watershed moments that, um, that sort of signal uh, a pivot in, in how you know, we are regarding wild animals in captivity. I think everyone by now knows that orcas were made to swim sometimes upwards of 100 miles a day um, in large pods, you know, families that are multi-generational, and to take an infant from one of those pods away from its mother and to force it to grow up in a little tank and perform silly tricks for, for a clapping crowd, I, don't, I just think that's something, you know, SeaWorld can see the writing on the wall. And, um, and now, you know, it, it, believe it or not, the CEO of SeaWorld, the guy who has just been in that position relatively recently, called the president and CEO of the Humane Society, his name is Wayne Paselli, and said, let's meet for coffee. And these two guys who, you know, bitter opponents on, you know, the issues over many, many years sat down and hammered out an agreement where SeaWorld agreed not just to end captive breeding, not just to end performing orca shows, but also to broaden their rescue and rehabilitation measure, to work hand in hand with the Humane Society of the United States and our global affiliate, the Humane Society International, in fighting things like international whaling by Japan and Iceland and Norway, and to ban really horrific uh, things like the Taiji Dolphin Massacre, to really expand their, their education mission uh, and to include more vegetarian options at, at SeaWorld. So, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, that, and that's the kind of engagement that, that I think it ultimately yields the, the, the biggest results. And this would be a great opportunity, I guess, for me to plug uh, my boss's new book that he's come out with. Wayne Paselli has written a new book called The Humane Economy. And I, I really recommend it to anyone who sort of wants to understand how uh, the humane movement is having an effect on commerce. Because we're seeing, you know, in things like the circuses and SeaWorld, but we're also seeing, you know, more and more food companies moving away from things like factory farmed eggs and factory farm, farmed meats and, and, and really starting to adopt animal welfare as corporate policy and how that's really yielding dividends. Uh, uh, both to consumers, to animals themselves, but also to you know uh, the shareholders of these corporations who want a good return on their investment. So, The Humane Economy by Wayne Tassello. Check it out. Hi, Spencer Irwin, for a member. Hi. Uh, what's the organized opposition to your measure? None. Sorry? None. No organized opposition. So my follow-up question is irrelevant, which is, what point did they make? <laughs> 
I think they make their point loud and clear, don't they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I will tell you this. Uh, both the NRA and Safari Club International, uh, both of which strongly support trophy hunting, um, they, uh, they challenged the ballot title uh, with the Secretary of State. Um, and uh, but we haven't heard from them since, and that was the only involvement uh, that we know of. In Washington, there was a, um, a very small group of loosely organized antique dealers who mounted a somewhat feeble uh, opposition campaign. But thus far, here in Oregon, there has been no no opposition. Chris Leslie, four member again. Yeah. Uh, the idea of the game preserves, like in Texas. I think they are sa uh, advertising that they're saving some species by having herds of animals on the preserves. Uh, how do you go along with that, even though they have trophy hunting, I understand? Well, this, this, is, this, is, uh, you know, this is the big debate between groups like the Humane Society and Safari Club International, and they you know, uh, Safari Club International makes the point that, you know, the money that a hunter pays to shoot an elephant can go towards conservation. We take the position that it is patently absurd to claim that you're saving an animal by shooting it. Um, and, and, you know, we believe very much that these animals should be preserved for the right reasons. And we believe that instead of, um, you know, the, the small amount of money that can be gained by trophy hunting, instead if you can uh, broaden the tourist opportunities and the ecotourism and, and you know, let that, uh, the, the proceeds from those kinds of, of enterprises trickle down and, and, and uh, help the local communities in Africa, but that's a far more sustainable way of, of managing these, these wild animals. I was thinking of the pronghorn sheep, is that right? Well, there's the pronghorn antelope, um, which of course, you know, is uh, indigenous to several western United States. But, you know, the, the, the preserves in Texas that you're talking about are largely captive hunt facilities where they take, you know, they, they either breed the animals or they buy cast-offs from zoos and circuses or roadside zoos and keep them in an enclosure and then these trophy hunters pay thousands of dollars for a guaranteed kill because you're shooting an animal that probably is expecting you to hand it a cookie or something. And uh, and you're basically shooting these animals in captivity. So. Thank you. Yeah. But Canada's big into that too. Canada? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Scott. Yes. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And Scott, if you would, because I know people like to run in here around one, if you want to run out and get what you Actually, need. Actually, I might have some here. Let me look. All right, Thank excellent. You. So yeah, those of you that are looking. Go ahead. Meeting with Abraham Lincoln. Is that your last meeting? No. Uh, next again. Next week we have no forum because of Memorial Day. June sixth is well, uh, President Lincoln. June thirteenth we have uh, uh, Dubrowski coming to talk about the Family Justice Center, and on the twentieth we have Jim Moore to talk about the uh, the primary election, and then to let us know some of the insights of what's going on in November, because hopefully somebody can make some sense out of that. On the twentieth will also be our annual meeting. The election of officers and a few other events. The 20th will be our last meeting until the first Monday after Labor Day in September. Right. Once again, to Mr. Beckstead, thank you very much, and thank you folks. We'll see you in two weeks with President Lincoln. Yeah, really? Yeah. I can we take this and circle like this? Is that what uh, if you want to, yeah, I'll show you. Uh, the, the blue ones are mine. If you want to circle that, I'll give you uh, yeah, a Whichever one you want us to use. So that that's so the I, I would ask you to sign the blue ones, but if you want to circulate and get the signatures yourself, then use the white ones. So where's the one? Well, I don't know.